Over the last few lectures, we've been talking about heat engines and Rankine cycles in particular. Last class, we introduced the idea of Rankine regeneration cycles. Now, in both of these types of cycles shown here, we split mass off in between the high pressure and low pressure turbines. We use that mass to preheat this mass flow of cold water that's coming into our feed heater so that we put less heat in at the steam generator. When we're trying to find our thermal efficiency, we use this generic equation here that we want to add the sum of the turbine powers with the sum of the pump powers, which are all negative, divided by the sum of all the places where we add heat. With our open feed water heater, we have two turbines, two pumps, and one place where we're adding heat. Often, we'll want to find the amount of mass flow diverted as a fraction of the total mass flow. We typically call that Y. And we'd want to find that usually by doing a first law analysis on the open feed water heater. Or maybe, like in the example that we had last class, we'll be given something like the net power of the cycle, or maybe the net power per unit mass flowing through the system, and we can use that to find an expression for Y so we can solve for that diverted mass flow rate. In the closed feed water heater, we also have two turbines, we have one pump, and we have one steam generator where we're adding heat. Again, we might want to find Y by doing a first law analysis on the closed feed water heater. It's a good idea to look for a heat exchanger. You can do a first law analysis on the whole heat exchanger and oftentimes that will help you find a mass flow rate. So the reason that we like to do a first law analysis on these entire heat exchangers is because they have more than one inlet and or more than one outlet. And that means that we can reduce, we can get rid of both the power term and the heat transfer term, and we're left with some equation that's a function of mass flow rates and enthalpies. So if we know the enthalpies, then often we can find the mass flow rates. Now we talked about doing a first law analysis on the closed feed water heater, but what about the condenser? Can you use the condenser to find why? Well, in a closed feed water heater system, this is where all the mass comes back together. So if we do this here in the condenser, we'll get some equations that are a function of Y and enthalpies. If we assume that the system is at steady state, that it's passive, that we can neglect the change in kinetic and potential energies, then we'll get an expression but here, we can't get rid of the Q dot term unless we know what's going on with the cooling water. So here, the cooling water is not shown, but there's something that we're rejecting heat to over here. So I have to leave this Q dot term here. So when I do this in the condenser, I can get an expression that has mass flow rates, Y, and enthalpies in it, but also this heat transfer term. So maybe I would know the total mass flow rate. I would know H3 if I can fix all the states, H8 and H4. But I wouldn't know the heat transfer rejected from the system, at least not with the information given, and I don't know why. So in order to find why from this condenser, I would need to find how much heat is rejected. Now, sometimes we'll be given that information. Maybe we'll have a cooling stream that comes here and we know the temperature that that cooling stream increases by as it goes through the condenser. We could use that to find Q dot, or in that case, we could just cancel Q dot here and have another inlet and another exit flow. Or if we knew Y, we could use Y here to find the amount of heat rejected from the system. So you can also, for both open and closed feed water heaters, do an analysis on the condenser Although in an open feed water heater, the Y won't show up in your condenser analysis, but you still might need it to try to find a mass flow rate, maybe the mass flow rate of the cooling water. So this, I think, will be the last word on Rankine cycles until we move to the final exam. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at 
other thermodynamic cycles. So we're going to kind of broaden our lens here to look at other different kind of cycles. And I think before we do that, one of the things I've been saying as we move through this class is that I want you to think of every thermodynamics problem as really the same problem. Just you have to go through a series of questions and depending on the answers to that questions, you'll follow different paths in this kind of choose your own adventure that is all of these thermodynamic problems. So the first thing that we'll want to do when we're solving a thermodynamic cycle is characterize the characterization parameter. So for heat engines, this will be thermal efficiency. And then we've talked about coefficients of performance for things like refrigeration and heat pump cycles. The second question we want to ask is, is the cycle open or closed? Or maybe rather, are the individual processes inside the cycle going to be treated as open systems or closed systems? We want to do conservation of mass, which is actually pretty trivial if it's a closed system. It just means all the mass stays inside my system. Then we'll want to do the first law on all the different processes. And then the second law on different elements if that's required. Next, we'll get some symbolic solutions from step two. But in order to get numerical solutions, we need to know the values of things like specific enthalpies, specific internal energies, or specific entropies. And in order to do that, we need to know what the working fluid is inside the system. Once we do that, we can fix all the states, maybe using tables, maybe using equations, if we're doing things like assuming that specific heat is constant. After that, we'll go back to the symbolic solutions that we found here in step two, and we'll add the values we have from our state table. That'll give us the power or the work or the heat transfer or the heat transfer rates that we're looking for. That will help us define the thermal efficiency or the coefficient of performance, and then we can compare that performance to the Carnot efficiency or the Carnot coefficient of performance for an ideal cycle. Now, you might be looking at this and say like, I'm not great at memorizing things. I know that's true for me. So this is kind of a lot to remember. So instead, we're gonna look at this as just a couple of things. So the first, when we have a thermodynamic cycle, we want to characterize the characterization parameter. So this will always be take the energy benefit and divide it by the energy cost. Now we have different Greek letters and different words for what these characterization parameters mean, but it's always take the energy benefit and divide by the energy cost. Next, we'll say, is this an open or a series of open processes or a series of closed processes? Now this is important because we'll have different versions of the first and second laws depending on what the answer to this question is. Finally, we want to know what's the fluid. Remember, there are basically two types of answers here. One is that it's something like water, and then we have to figure out what's the phase, or are we going through an ideal pump? The second is, is it an ideal gas? And if it's an ideal gas, we have to say, is it constant specific heat or variable specific heat? And if you can answer these three questions for different cycles, then I think you'll be able to treat all of these cycle analysis problems as really the same problems. They just have different permutations of what the answers to question one, two, and three are. So we've been talking about Rankine cycles, and now we're going to move on to something completely different. We're going to start to talk about internal combustion engines or ICE engines. Now, this class will be about engine terminology. So I know maybe you guys get the same thing. So I'm a mechanical engineer by training, but I'm not super into cars, right? So people will sometimes say to me when they find out I'm a mechanical engineer, I'm a professor of mechanical engineering, and they'll say, well, you know, my car's been making this kind of funny noise. Do you know what's wrong with it? Right? And I'll, and I'll you know, invariably say, well, you should probably go see a mechanic, right? Um, you know, it's kind of like uh, with computers. I know if they don't work, you uh, turn them off and turn them back on again. You know, with uh, with my car, you know, I change my own oil. I rotate my own tires. But outside of that, if there's something wrong, I take it to a mechanic. So I think when we're talking about these internal combustion engines, there'll be some subset of students who are, you know, maybe they're on a Formula SAE team. Maybe they're like super into automobiles and how they work. And that's great, um, especially in this 
class, this particular lecture, you know, these students could probably come up to the front of the room and, and give maybe even better explanations of different uh, components or different terms that we're going to talk about today. But I want you to know that if you're not that person, if you're not someone who's um, kind of lives and breathes the automobile industry, this is still something that's important for you to learn. And this is still something that, that you'll certainly be able to learn. You don't have to be a car nut in order to be able to uh, solve these internal combustion engine problems. And what we're going to see is that even though, you know, I'm kind of implying that these internal combustion engines are something completely different from Rankine cycles, I think what we're really going to find is that they're really only partially different as long as we keep those three big questions in mind. So first, what is an internal combustion engine or an ICE engine, right? So here, this is a cutaway of what a four-cylinder internal combustion engine looks like. So we have these uh, pistons that are inside these cylinders and these pistons are moving up and down, right? As this drive shaft turns and we've got these valves that are opening and closing depending on what's going on, right? We like internal combustion engines, right? At least if we, uh, if we like to get to and from work, if we're using automobiles, right? Or maybe if we're driving this big truck, right? So if you, uh, if you eat groceries from the grocery store, right? Those things get to the store and basically everything gets to everywhere because people are driving trucks around the United States. So when we think about thermodynamically, we got to ask ourselves, what's the benefit of an internal combustion engine? Because that'll help us get this characterization parameter, right? So an internal combustion engine is still a heat engine, right? So this is one of those cases in mechanical engineering where we get heat and don't want to boil water, but the energy benefit is still that we want to produce power with this internal combustion engine. We're burning a fuel, happens to be a fossil fuel, right? And we're using that heat to create some mechanical work or power. So the energy benefit here is work or power. Now, what's the energy cost? Right now, currently, with the lockdown, I think the last time I filled my car up, it was uh, something like a dollar eighty-five per gallon, right? Which is a huge shock to me because I I grew up in Canada, right? So when I left Canada, um, gas prices were something like a dollar thirty-five per liter, right? So there's more than four liters in a gallon. So gas in Canada is certainly more expensive than it is here in the U.S. Um, but the cost here, right, both from the financial perspective and from the environmental perspective, is that we need to have gasoline inside of our car or maybe it's diesel fuel right but we need something to burn right and the reason thermodynamically we need that fuel is because we want to add heat or we need some heat transfer rate going into our engine because ultimately the energy transaction that we're making is we're turning some of that input heat into work so internal combustion engines are heat engines. Now they work certainly differently than Rankine cycles, but when we characterize them, we characterize them the same way, right? So here, if this was Calvin and Planck talking, our engine is here in the middle. We're taking some heat from some hot reservoir. In this case, we're burning our fuel and we're producing work. But what Calvin and Planck told us is that we need to have a heat sink for our engine. Otherwise it will overheat and stop working. So we know that because this is a heat engine and the energy benefit is power or work and the cost is heat or heat transfer rate, we know that we're looking at a thermal efficiency. And if I can find the network or the heat in, and if I can find the power or the heat transfer rate in, then I can find the thermal efficiency. Now, one of the tricks that we'll use here is we gotta remember that if we look at the cycle as one closed system, then we know that the net power is equal to the net heat transfer rate, or heat in minus heat out. Or if this is a closed system and we're not interested in the rate equations, we also know that the net work is equal to the heat in minus the heat out. So from a characterization perspective, these internal combustion engines look just like Rankine cycles. So the characterization parameter is the same as we've been dealing with in these steam engines. So what are the differences, right, between this Rankine cycle and this internal combustion engine? 
So first, we know that they're both heat engines, so the characterization parameter is the same. Second, when we look at the Rankine cycle in each individual process, we treated this as an open system. So we used the open version of the first law to move through all of these different components. Now this isn't going to be strictly true for internal combustion engines. It turns out to analyze these things with pen and paper, we'll make a lot of assumptions. So we'll be drifting further and further away from reality. One of the assumptions that we're going to make here is that the system is always closed. Now in a real internal combustion engine, this is only true when both the intake and exhaust valve are closed. But for our purposes, we're going to treat all of these as closed systems. Our third question is, what's the working fluid? So in an internal combustion engine, we had water that we were constantly boiling and condensing and boiling and condensing so we can run in and out of this turbine. But in an internal combustion engine, we'll say that the working fluid is an ideal gas. Typically, we'll say that this is air. Even though in a real internal combustion engine, the working fluid is some combination of air and fuel. It's some air-fuel mixture, which changes throughout the process as we burn the fuel and there are different chemical reactions going on inside the cylinder. But we're going to neglect all those things because we want to be able to solve these problems with pen and paper. So when we look at the internal combustion engine, in some ways, it's very different than the Rankine cycle, but it's still a heat engine, right? So in one important way, it's still very similar to this Rankine cycle. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of the nomenclature. That's like the engineering decoder ring word for the words that we use, right? So what are the words that we use when we're talking about a piston? So here, this is kind of my crude drawing of a piston inside a cylinder, right? So it's only 2D, right? But you could imagine revolving this three-dimensionally if this was axisymmetric, right? So what happens here, I like this animation, so I'm going to show it to you again, is that the piston moves up and down inside the cylinder. So when it's at its lowest position in the cylinder here, we call this bottom dead center. Because your piston is centered directly inside the cylinder and it's at the bottom of its travel. Similarly, when the piston is at its uppermost position, we say that it's at top dead center. Again, centered inside the cylinder, but at the top of its travel. Now you'll notice that when it's at the top of the travel, it's not actually at the top of the cylinder. There's still a gap here. Right, so there's a couple different volumes inside the cylinder that we're interested in here. But first, before we define those, we want to say that as the piston moves, the length between bottom dead center and top dead center, that's the piston's stroke, or sometimes stroke length. So that's the length between bottom dead center and top dead center. So for the piston to go through a whole cycle, so one revolution because this piston is, is attached to a shaft. So in one revolution, the piston moves up and down. So it goes through two strokes for one revolution. Now we have something called the displacement volume. So that's the volume in the cylinder between top dead center and bottom dead center. So if you imagine if an exhaust valve here was open, and the piston moved from bottom dead center up to top dead center, it would displace all of this volume and push it out of the cylinder. So in a real internal combustion engine, we do that after the fuel is spent. So one of the strokes in a four stroke engine will be exhausting this spent air fuel mixture because what happened is we've burned the fuel and we've used up some of the oxygen in the air so we want to expel that and bring in new fresh air so that we can burn the fuel again. But we'll notice that that displacement volume isn't the whole volume between bottom dead center and the top of the cylinder. So we also have this extra bit of volume at the top that doesn't get displaced. Now, one of the important things that we'll use to characterize different engines is called the compression ratio. So the compression ratio 
tells us something about the different volumes. You can see I like this animation. So I'm going to try to show you this animation as many times as I can, right? So here we have the volume at bottom dead center. This is the volume between the upper face of the piston and the top face of the cylinder. So this is the whole volume inside the cylinder when the piston is at bottom dead center. But we also have this volume that's also defined by the top of the piston face in the upper surface of this cylinder when the, when the piston is at top dead center. So we have the volume at bottom dead center here in purple and the volume at top dead center here in orange. So our compression ratio is going to be the volume at bottom dead center divided by the volume at top dead center. And this ratio should always be bigger than one. So if you're calculating a compression ratio and you get that it's less than one, it's likely that you're either dealing with the wrong volumes or that you flipped this fraction over. Another thing we want to worry about is engine speed. So depending on, if you're in your car, depending on how you're depressing the gas pedal, the engine will run at different speeds. So it's moving up and down and up and down, but how is that engine speed measured? So typically, because all of these um, pistons are basically run on something like a four bar linkage and they're connected to a drive shaft. So what happens is as that drive shaft is spinning or sometimes depending on which stroke you're in, sometimes it's the piston that's moving down that's driving that drive shaft. So we have, we measure the speed of an engine by how fast that drive shaft is spinning. So it's not measured in a linear velocity or a linear speed of how fast this piston is moving up and down. Instead, we talk about the RPM of the engine or the rotations per minute. How fast is that drive shaft spinning? So in other engineering classes, you might be used to thinking of uh, angular velocity as um, radians per second. So you might be used to this um, variable omega. So in that case, if you want to turn rotations per minute into omega, which is radians per second, the first thing we have to recognize is that there are 60 seconds in a minute. So we have to take this RPM value and divide by 60, right? That gets rid of the minutes and has, gives us rotations per second. But if we want radians, then we need to know that in one rotation, there are two pi radians, or 360 degrees if you wanted to have degrees per second. And then we would divide by rotations here. So then our minutes would cancel out, our rotations would cancel out, and we would have radians per second. So that's how we would get the angular velocity of the drive shaft in radians per second. So now you may have heard of different types of internal combustion engines, like two-stroke engines or four-stroke engines. So oftentimes, if you have like a little dirt bike or another thing, you know, if you have a gas-powered uh, weed whacker, right, then that will often run on a two-stroke engine. So in a two-stroke engine, what we're talking about is it takes two strokes to complete the entire cycle. So remember, a stroke is when the piston moves from bottom dead center to top dead center or from top dead center back to bottom dead center. And what happens is in one rotation of this drive shaft, then the piston will move two strokes. So if it was at bottom dead center and we went one full rotation, half the rotation would be pushing the piston up and the other half would be pulling the piston back down. So in a two-stroke engine, the entire cycle occurs across two strokes. If you have um, sort of something like a larger motorcycle or your, your car engine will be a four-stroke engine. So now to do an entire cycle, we need four strokes. So four strokes means bottom dead center to top dead center, that's one stroke. Back down, that's two strokes. Back up, that's three strokes. And then back down, that's four strokes. So in a two-stroke engine, we only needed one revolution of the crankshaft to get um, 
to get one cycle. But in a four-stroke engine, we need four strokes to get one cycle, and we need we get two revolutions per stroke, so we need two revolutions to get the whole cycle, right? So we only get four strokes after two revolutions. Another way we can classify engines is how they ignite the fluid. So here inside the piston, we have this um, air fuel mixture, right? So there's some fuel in here and there's some air in here. So what happens is we can ignite this with a spark. So you may have, uh, so on my lawnmower, right? I got a lot riding lawnmower and a John Deere, right? And I need to change the spark plug every once in a while, right? Because this is a spark ignition engine. So what happens is as we compress this air fuel mixture, right? There's some timing that happens and we send an electrical pulse into the spark plug that makes a spark here, right? This is the same thing um, on some uh, gas barbecues, right? So some propane barbecues, um, they'll also have a spark ignition or maybe if you have a natural gas uh, cooktop or stovetop, then, you know, it, when you when you turn the valve, it goes like tick, 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 and you can hear it. And if you actually look in, you can see the spark. Well, the same thing happens in one of these spark ignition engines is that a little spark happens across this spark plug and that ignites the fuel. And when the fuel ignites, right, it heats up very quickly and it expands, right? So this, this hot air tries to expand and that expansion is what then pushes the piston down right? And that then is pushing that piston down. That piston is connected to this drive shaft, right? And then that, that sort of, as the piston is getting pushed down by this reaction that's happening inside the chamber, it's turning the crankshaft or the drive shaft, right? So typically spark ignition engines are something we learn, we use on lower power vehicles, right? So um, I, you have a Toyota Venza, right? It's a, it's a four cylinder engine, so it's running on this spark ignition type uh, engine. So typically these are used for lighter weight vehicles if you're not pulling a lot, um, and they tend to be lower cost. So most cars in North America run on spark ignition engines. Now there's another way to ignite the fuel here. So here, um, so this is kind of showing a fuel injector. You've got this air fuel mixture, right? So you kind of uh, atomize the flow, the fuel, and you put it in here and you're pushing this piston up. But what happens as you compress this fluid, right? Remember, it's an ideal gas, right? So PV is equal to NRT, right? Or PV is equal to MRT if we're talking about mass, but then we're talking about the uh, specific gas constant and not the universal gas constant. But as the pressure goes up, right? That's PV, the pressure goes up the temperature on the other side is going up too, right? So what happens here is if you compress the fluid enough, the temperature of the gas is going to get hot enough to, to ignite the fuel itself. So in a compression engine, there's no spark plug. It's actually just the act of compressing this air-fuel mixture that causes it to ignite. So here you get higher power with fuel efficiency. So you can run at higher powers and have better fuel efficiency at that higher power. So if you're if you need a lower power, spark ignition probably gives you better efficiency, but if you need high power, right? So if you're pulling a a big rig, right? So if you're if you're riding a truck, then maybe you have a compression ignition engine here because you get better fuel efficiency at high powers. So things like heavy trucks or buses or trains um, ships. So sometimes you'll have internal combustion engine powered uh, ships, or maybe you have uh, gas generators and maybe they're running on this compression style engine. So when we're talking about internal combustion engines, we'll want to plot these cycles on PV diagrams. Remember PV diagrams were important when we were talking about closed systems because we know the area under the curve tells us something about the work or the power, right? Because the work, remember, was the integral of PDV. Remember that from the first section of the course, right? But it turns out that um, internal combustion engines are pretty complicated. So if I drew out what looks like maybe a real internal combustion engine cycle, it would look something like this sketch that's in your textbook. So what happens here, right? So we start with the piston moving down, right? 
And now we've opened the intake valve, right? So we're gonna start over here, right? So when the intake valve is open and the piston is moving down, this is kind of like the cylinder breathing, right? It's bringing in fresh air that has more oxygen so we can combust the fuel, right? So when this valve is open and the piston's moving down, we get mass flow into the cylinder, right? So this is moving here from this part. It goes through this intake stroke, right? So this is for a four-stroke engine. So this is our first stroke. We started off at top dead center, right? Or close to top dead center anyway, with this intake valve open, the exhaust valve closed, and the piston is moving down. And that pulls air into the cylinder. As we do that, what happens is the volume is increasing, but the pressure stays fairly constant, right? Because this is open, we're at atmospheric pressure, more or less. Then what's going to happen is at the bottom of this stroke, the intake valve is going to close, right? So now we've got air inside of our system. So now our piston is around bottom dead center, and we have this cylinder that's full of clean air, but it's only at atmospheric pressure. So we want to drive that pressure up. So what we do is we close that intake valve. So now both of these valves are closed and the piston, as this crankshaft is moving around and around, the piston starts to go back up. And what happens, because both valves are closed and the volume is getting smaller, we're compressing this air. We're increasing the pressure inside the air. Now at some point here, what happens if this is a spark ignition engine is our spark plug goes off, right? The valves stay closed. We've got this air fuel mixture at some high pressure and now we ignite the fuel. So what happens is when we ignite the fuel, it burns. And as it burns, its temperature goes up. And because its temperature is going up, that gas wants to expand. So as it expands, with both of these valves closed, what happens is the gas is expanding and now it's pushing that piston down. So for our first two strokes, there was some other piston that was driving this shaft. But now as we're in this power stroke where the gas is expanding, it's now pushing this piston down, right? So it pushes this piston down and that's generating work or power. Right? So here, we've ignited our fuel, the piston is moving down, and we move up and around. Right, So as we do this, right now our volume is increasing, and as our volume increases, our pressure goes down. But now, it's the gas expanding that's pushing that piston down. So remember, that means we're doing work on the surroundings. But now, we're at bottom dead center, and we've got this exhaust gas that's inside of our system. So what we do, we're at bottom dead center. We've got this, um, again, it's a lower pressure inside of our cylinder, but now we've got this kind of spent air fuel mixture. So we want to get rid of that so we can bring new air in because we need the oxygen in the air to burn the fuel. So what we do is we open now the exhaust valve and the piston moves up again. So now it's moving up. And as it moves up, right, the volume gets smaller, but now this valve is open. So what happens is the piston moves up, the volume goes down, but we're getting rid of this exhaust, right? So we're getting rid of this um, spent air fuel mixture. And now we're right back to where we were at the beginning so we can keep continuously running this internal combustion engine cycle. Right? It's important to remember that in a four-cylinder four engine, you have different cylinders that are at different timings. So basically, in a four-cylinder engine, you're always going to have one of your cylinders that's in the power stroke. So it's kind of like they're taking turns which cylinder is in the power stroke, because otherwise you'd get kind of this very jerky ride. If you only had one cylinder, or if all your cylinders were timed the same, you would get this workout and then you'd stop as you did the other three strokes, and then you'd get the workout, and then you'd stop, as you, right? But we want kind of a more continuous ride than that, so we stagger the timing of our different cylinders so that, um, two, so that one of them is in the power stroke all the time.
So here, when we look at this internal combustion engine, one of these cylinders is always going to be running in the power stroke at a time so that we get kind of a consistent work or power through the engine. So as you might imagine, analysis of this PV diagram would be very, very complicated, right? So this is the kind of thing that you can't really do with a pen and paper. So what we're doing in this class, remember what I said at the beginning of the class is I think this is one of the classes where you start to learn that it, what we do as engineers is we try to improve or design different uh, systems without having perfect understanding of how the system is working, right? So what we're going to do is we're not going to look at this actual internal combustion engine. We're going to make some kind of idealized um, internal combustion engine so that we can analyze it, right? And by doing that, we're going to make a lot of assumptions. Some of them might seem almost like too, going too far, but this analysis model that we're going to build, this mathematical model that we're going to build, is still going to be useful. It's going to tell us some information that we can still use to make internal combustion engines better, right? So it's not, it's not a perfect model. So in order to get a more accurate model, you'd probably want to move from this analytical model to a numerical model where you're simulating these things on a computer. And then before you build something sort of at production levels, you want to make a prototype and you want to test that prototype to see how well it works. Right? So modeling a real internal combustion engine generally requires numerical simulation because it's very complicated. Right? You look at this, the cycle's not adiabatic, right? So we're sort of losing heat or adding heat, right? There's combustion of the air fuel mixture. So, you know, we wouldn't just be able to use one gas constant, right? It, because the gas constant would be changing as we're burning the fuel. There's kinetic energy, right? Obviously these pistons are moving up and down, right? They're moving with some velocity. That velocity could certainly be important in the problem. This is a transient problem. So we wouldn't be able to say it's at steady state. So things like the pressure and the temperature, they're changing with time. So this is a very complicated process. On top of all that, as we went through these different strokes, we saw that sometimes the internal combustion engine acts as an open system with one of those valves open, but sometimes it acts as a closed system, right? So this is all really very complicated, right? I want to be able to get a reasonable answer when I'm modeling these types of systems using pen and paper, and I just can't do it if I don't make a whole suite of assumptions to simplify the problem. So we're going to do what we call an air standard analysis of an internal combustion engine. So in order to analyze an internal combustion engine, we're going to make several assumptions. First, we're going to neglect combustion. We recognize that inside the cylinder, there's actually this air fuel mixture and that changes as we're burning the fuel, but we're going to neglect that. We're going to say that it's not this chemical process that's happening inside the cylinder. We're just going to pretend that we add heat from some exterior source. We're going to say that the system is always closed. Now, normally what that means is that we're going to be using specific internal energies and not enthalpies, right? But really more generally, what this means is that we're going to use our closed system versions of the first and second law. And we don't have to worry about mass conservation very much because if the system is closed, mass conservation just tells us, yep, all the mass stays in the cylinder. We're also going to say that all of these processes are reversible. Remember thermodynamically, reversible means that there's no entropy generated, right? So sometimes when we're doing work or having work done to the system, that also equates to the process being isentropic. And looking for those isentropic processes will be very important for solving these cycles. We'll assume that the working fluid is an ideal gas, specifically air. Again, we know that this isn't true, that the working fluid is some combination of air and fuel that changes as we move around our cycle. But making this assumption helps us to get a new, an analytical answer, right? We're also sometimes going to make one more assumption, right? So if we move from an air standard analysis to a cold air standard analysis, that means we'll be assuming that the specific heat is constant. 
right? Remember, if the specific heat is constant, then I can use equations that have Cp, Cv, or K in them because those numbers aren't changing as we move through these different processes. So as you see, when we make these kind of assumptions, you know, every assumption we're making here steps us further and further away from reality. So we have to remember that, that when we find answers using our model here, our air standard analysis model, we got to remember that the actual values we get, right, the math that we do, might not be the exact right answer, right? Instead, it's more qualitatively what we'll see is how do we change different parameters like a compression ratio and if we change those parameters how does that affect the performance of the engine am i going to get more power am i going to improve my fuel efficiency maybe even a simple model like this where we make all of these different assumptions can help us improve the performance of the engine so it's important to remember here that the results from this kind of modeling are more qualitative than quantitative. So here's some basic characterization parameters outside of thermal efficiency for these particular cycles. So first, we want to know what the mean effective pressure is, right? This is abbreviated MEP. So the mean effective pressure, as defined in your textbook, is the net work for one cycle divided by the displacement volume, right? Remember that work is the integral of PDV, but if you had a process where the pressure was constant, then what you would do is you would take that out of your integral and you would say that work is equal to P times delta V. So we know that there's no constant pressure inside of our engine. But this mean effective pressure is a characterization parameter we use if we say, well, what if we look at the displacement volume, right? And we consider that our delta V term. What would be the equivalent average pressure if we took the net work and we knew the displacement volume? What's the equivalent average pressure we get, right? And that's the mean effective pressure. So if you have an engine, right, and it has the same displacement volume, if you get a higher mean effective pressure, what that means is you'll get more net work, right? So this isn't really a physical parameter. There's no, like maybe there's some instant or a couple of instants across your cycle where you're at this mean effective pressure, but it's not really a, a real physical thing. But if I tell you the mean effective pressure of two different engines, and I tell you that the volumes are the same, you'd be able to tell me which one is delivering more power. If an engine is running at the same RPM, if you have a higher mean effective pressure, then you also get more net work. So again, this can be a useful parameter to understand when you're comparing two different engines. So now how do we evaluate heat engines, right? Globally, the most important characterization parameter we're going to be interested in is this thermal efficiency, right? The energy benefit divided by the energy cost. So if we're talking about closed systems, we will often talk about this in terms of the work per cycle and the heat added per cycle. But we also can talk about the power of an engine, right? So if you, if you read about you know, cars, you'll often know what the horsepower of a particular engine is, right? So sometimes it's important to know the rate of work or the power, which means that we also have to know something about the rate of heat addition. We know that net power is equal to the heat rate in minus the heat rate out. So how do I find work and heat in this internal combustion engine? The answer, this is usually the answer if you don't know what to do in thermodynamics, use the first law, right? So should we use an open version of the first law or a closed version of the first law, right? Here, we want to use the closed version of the first law. Remember the closed version of the first law we have this picture, right? We have this system. We're moving from one energy state to another energy state. And that's because we're adding heat or work is coming out of our system. So we know that the closed version of the first law, maybe we remember this, or maybe we've tried to repress these particular memories, right? We know that the change in the internal energy is equal to Q minus W. So if we want thermal efficiency, we'd have the work out. So this is going to be in the power stroke plus the work in, 
in the compression stroke divided by the heat transfer in. <clears throat> we can divide all of these components by the mass in the cylinder, which remember remains constant, so it's the same mass everywhere. So even if we don't know the mass, then this thermal efficiency is also going to be the specific work out plus the specific work in divided by the specific heat in. Or if I want to know the powers, this is the same thing, right? So now I would have the power out plus the power in, which is negative, divided by the heat rate in. But we're going to find power a little bit differently in these cases, right? We're used to, from Rankine cycles, talking about power and heat rates as m dot times delta h. But that doesn't make any sense in an internal combustion engine with the assumptions we're making because we're assuming that m dot is zero everywhere. So we'll have to think about a different way to find the powers and the heat rates. So when I look at my first law, I got to find work or heat. Right? So usually what I'll do in this internal combustion engine is I'll assume that each process is a simple system. Remember, simple systems have either work or heat. So if I'm trying to find work, I'll assume that the process is adiabatic. And if the process is adiabatic, work is equal to, so work from state 1 to state 2, is going to be U at A minus U at B. Right? And if I take the specific work, then it divide all these terms by m and I get lowercase letters. Now if a process is passive, meaning that I'm adding or rejecting heat, then I'm going to get rid of my work term. And there I'm going to find for q, this is going to be u at the end of my system minus u at the beginning of my process. Right? So this is a little bit like when we worked on Rankine cycles. Remember, if we were trying to find power, it was h in minus h out. Right? That's, a, you know, in a elapsed time version, maybe that looks like u at the beginning minus u at the end. Whereas for heat, it was h out minus h in. So if I'm trying to find heat here, it's going to be u at the end minus u at the beginning. The good news is you don't have to memorize any of this stuff. You just derive it from the first law. Right? All you have to do, oh, I'm trying to find Q. Okay, I'll cancel out W and I'll get that uh, that, that equals to delta U. Right, But then you, the order will flip because the sign of Q and the sign of W are different in the first law. Once we get to this point, now we're asking what's the fluid? Right, This is always an important question. Remember our three important questions? Right, How do I characterize the cycle? Is it open or closed? And what's the fluid? Now our fluid is going to be ideal gas. So because it's air that's an ideal gas, we can use the ideal gas law. So remember, in mechanical engineering, the ideal gas law we're going to use uses the specific gas constant, right? So it's going to be different for every gas. But the benefit of doing that is that when we quantify how much stuff we have, we use mass instead of moles, right? So we can use PV is equal to RT, or P volume is equal to M times R. T. remember R is the specific gas constant over here, the mass would be the number of moles times the molar mass. If I'm moving between processes, so this is good if I'm trying to, if I'm at one state and I'm trying to find maybe the temperature given the pressure, the volume, and the mass, right? But oftentimes I'll be moving from one state to another state and throughout all of this process, throughout the whole internal combustion engine cycle, we're going to assume that it's closed system, so the mass is constant, and that there's no chemical reaction happening in our gas, so the specific gas constant remains the same as well. So here, I can say that P1, V1 over T1 is going to be equal to P2, V2 over T2. So there's different ways that I can use the ideal gas law. So I can use this more than once in every different process. Right? A lot of times we'll want to find T for different states. So when I'm dealing with an ideal gas, right, the second part of my what's the fluid question is, do I have variable specific heat or do I have constant specific heat? And depending on what the answer is here, we're going to get different uh, methodologies, right? Different ways to go about doing things, right? So if it's variable specific heat, when I find delta U, it's just going to be delta U. So I'm going to try to figure out what the temperatures are, maybe by using the ideal gas law. And then I'll go to something like table A22, 
and I'll look up what the temperature is, and that will help me to interpolate to find the specific internal energy of my fluid at that temperature. So this is going to be a function of temperature inside table A22. All right, so I need table A22 if I'm going to assume that it's variable specific heat. If it's constant specific heat, I'm never actually going to find the individual specific internal energies. Instead, because the first law asks for delta U, I'm going to say that delta U is CV times delta T. Remember, I got to pick CV and not CP here. Now, if the process is isentropic, right? So this happens if I'm getting work out of my system or if I'm putting work into my system, then if it's variable specific heat, what's going to happen is we can use this equation of the ratio of the reduced volumes is going to be equal to the ratio of volumes, right? And because the mass is constant, then this ratio of reduced volumes is also going to be equal to the ratio of specific volumes, right? This only works if the process is isentropic. But the good news is for ideal gases, we're assuming that every process is ideal. So if we're getting work either in or out of our system, then we can use this equation, right? So if you look on table A22, it won't have specific volumes like a table for water would, but it will have these reduced specific volumes. So again, if I knew the temperature, then I can look up VR for that same state, just like I could look up U. And then if I knew the volume ratio, then I could find VR at 2S, right? So remember this volume ratio is kind of the compression ratio, right? So here, if I could find VR2S, then I could use this to interpolate back and find U and the appropriate temperature at that state. Now, if it's constant specific heat, then I'm going to look for an equation with K in the exponent, right? So both of these equations, this one and this one, they're on our equation sheet, right? Now, with closed systems, usually we'll know volume ratios. So I'll be looking for isentropic equations that have volume ratios in them. If I'm variable specific heat, I can't have a CP, a CV, or a K in my equation, so I pick this one. But if it's constant specific heat, I look at the equations that have K in the exponent. Remember, K is CP divided by CV, or 1.4 for air. So I can use this equation to find T2S if I know T1 and I know the ratio of volumes across a particular process, which is given by the compression ratio. So hopefully to this point, you're starting to get at least some idea of what we're going to do when we look at these internal combustion engines. But we're going to look at different kinds of internal combustion engines in this class, right? So mostly we're going to focus on the auto cycle and the diesel cycle. We probably won't get to look at the dual cycle in this class, but the dual cycle is a combination of the auto cycle and the diesel cycle, right? So in the textbook, there are three different types of internal combustion engines that they look at. And the way that we classify these different types of engines basically comes down to what assumptions we're making when we're adding heat into our system. So in an auto cycle, we assume that heat addition happens at constant volume. In the diesel cycle, we'll assume that heat addition happens at constant pressure. And in the dual cycle, we'll assume that there's this two-part heat addition phase where we first add heat at constant volume and then add heat at constant pressure. So the dual cycle is some combination of the auto cycle and the diesel cycle. So what we'll do over the next two lectures um, is we'll talk about how do we find or how do we do the analysis for auto cycles and diesel cycles. So the next thing that we want to look at, remember we said that um, power is going to be found differently in this internal combustion engine than we did in the Rankine cycle. If you remember in a Rankine cycle, if we were interested in power, we would take the mass flow rate times H in minus H out. But we can't do that in an internal combustion engine because we're assuming that M dot is always zero. So how do I get power in heat rate terms if that's what I'm looking for? Right? So if I want to find out how much horsepower is developed in my engine, how do I do that? So here, this is the equation that we'll use. Right? So we want to take the work that's done in a whole cycle, right? So the whole cycle means all of the processes that we're going to work with, right? So this is one cycle. So in a two-stroke engine, this is in two strokes. In a four-stroke engine, this is in four strokes. 
So how much work is done in a whole internal combustion engine cycle? But then we need to figure out how many cycles per second we have in our engine, right? So this is something to do with how fast our drive shaft is spinning, right? So the work is going to be in joules per cycle. And then this capital omega, which tells us something about the speed of an engine, is going to be in cycles per second. The same thing with the heat rate. We'll find the heat per cycle and multiply by how many cycles we go through in a second. So how do we go from RPM, which is normally what, let's say, a tachometer in your engine is going to measure, to cycles per second? So the first thing we need to know is, is it a four-stroke or a two-stroke engine? Because if it's a four-stroke engine, then we need two rotations for every cycle. Here, to get cycles per second, We'll take rotations per minute, which is often what we know. We have to multiply by one minute divided by 60 seconds. So that's going to get us rotations per second. But we don't want rotations per second. We want cycles per second. So in a four-stroke engine, we know that one cycle takes two rotations. So we further have to multiply one by one cycle divided by two rotations. So here we take RPM, we divide by 60, and then we divide by 2. But we got to track our units to make sure we're doing things correctly. If it's a two-stroke engine, the process is pretty similar, except now we have one cycle per rotation instead of two, one cycle per two rotations. So now we only have to divide RPM by 60. So what do we do when we start to deal with imperial units? Right? We know life is usually harder in imperial units. Right, so here, if we want power, we're going to find the work in BTU. Because when we look up U in the textbook, it's going to be in BTU per pound mass. Then we're going to want to find out how many cycles per minute there are. Because our conversion from BTU per minute to horsepower is what's on our equation sheet. So here, we got to take the cycle work, multiply that by how many cycles per minute we have, and then multiply that by one horsepower divided by 42.2 42.4 BTU per minute. And that will give us the power of the engine in horsepower. We can do the same process for the heat transfer rate, except we sub substitute the heat per cycle, right? Or maybe the heat in, in the cycle, instead of the work per cycle. Again, when we're trying to figure out how many cycles per minute we have, for a four-stroke engine, we have to remember that there are two rotations per cycle. So if we want to have, this would give us here rotations per second. But if we want rotations per or cycles per minute, then we wouldn't multiply by this part here. But we do have to remember that we need to know what the cycles per rotation are. Same thing with a two-stroke engine. Here, for every rotation, we get one cycle. So how do we do the second law in one of these internal combustion engines, right? So now we're going to have an ideal gas. So our delta S in a closed system is going to be M times delta specific S. And that's going to be Q over T plus sigma from A to B. Now, we're always assuming in these processes that they're reversible. So that means sigma, our entropy generation, is going to be zero. So if we're trying to find delta S, we have to remember, are we in variable specific heat? Then we can use this equation, looking up S superscript zero in our textbook. Remember, this is the change in the specific entropy due to the change in temperature. But then there's also an analytical part here due to the change in entropy from the change in pressure. Or if we have constant specific heat, we'll use one of these two equations, depending on whether or not we know the ratio of temperatures and the ratio of pressures or the ratio of temperatures and the ratio of volumes. Typically, for internal combustion engines, we'll know volume ratios and temperature ratios. And if it was an open system, we would know temperature ratios and pressure ratios. So that concludes the lecture for today. Um, next couple of classes, we'll start to do examples on how to do auto cycles and diesel cycles so we can start to put this information into practice. So thanks for joining me on Thermodynamics. I'll see you again next time.